Thank you so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate it, particularly coming out of fall break and on what has turned into a jury day. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled. Uh, first, I guess I should introduce myself or not. Um, I'm Stacey Goddard. Um, I'm a professor of political science and also the faculty director of the Albright Institute. Um, and I'm beyond thrilled to introduce Sarah Budgood. Um, Sarah is the director of the Eurasia Nonproliferation Program at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies in Monterey, California. She is a Wellesley alum, yeah. having gotten her BA in Russian. <laughs> from Wellesley College. She also ho holds a master's in Russian and East, uh, East European and Eurasian Studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and a master's in nonproliferation and terrorism studies from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey. Her research focuses on US-Soviet and US-Russia nonproliferation cooperation, which of course is not at all relevant for contemporary politics, I joke, as well as the international nonproliferation regime more broadly. She's the co-editor of the book, Once and Future Partners, the United States, Russia, and Nuclear Nonproliferation, which was published by the International Institute for Strategic Studies in 2018. And she also leads the Young Women in Nonproliferation in Initiative at the Center uh, for, for uh, Nonproliferation Studies. And this, I have to say, I know I said this to you personally, over the years, I have had not only so many students, but run it now into so many people who have joined that initiative. And it's an initiative that brings together mentors, um, women in, in, in the field of, 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 of uh, nuclear nonproliferation, um, which is a field that has been very gender exclusive historically, one might say. Um, so to be able to have somebody who initiated that is extraordinarily valuable. Um, and I cannot thank you enough for doing it. What Sarah will be talking about today is looking over the brink, the war in Ukraine, and the future of U.S.-Russia arms control. Um, I'm hoping at the very least we might hear that there is a future to U.S.-Russia arms control. So welcome back to Wellesley College, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Goddard. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Professor Hodge. Um, it's really a privilege to be back here. I love coming to Wellesley. Wellesley has turned me into the person that I am today. So it's always really special to be back here on campus and thank you for welcoming me. So as Professor Goddard says, I'm gonna talk about looking over the brink, the war in Ukraine and the future of US and Russian arms control. What I thought I would do by way of an agenda is to talk a little bit about what US and Soviet arms control and non-proliferation cooperation are because I feel like that's not a topic that we necessarily hear that much about and I wanna make sure that we're all kind of on the same page here. I want to talk a little bit about what drives cooperation, what accounts for it, what explains why adversaries who otherwise have very divergent interests and threats would work together on such sensitive issues relating to nuclear weapons and nuclear policy. And then I want to ask a question. You know, do nuclear crises drive arms control? I think that's particularly relevant for today, but we have a lot of historical examples that we can look at as well. And I'm going to do that by unpacking some findings from the Cuban Missile Crisis and comparing them with what we're seeing now. And then we're going to talk about what this means for the future. What is the future of arms control going to look like in the context of the war in Ukraine? And then of course, I'd be delighted to answer any questions that you guys have, so I hope you'll be thinking of some. Okay, so what is arms control? I know that those of you who have just been in Professor Goddard's class don't need any introduction to this, but for the rest of us, um, I really like this definition from Schelling and Halperin from 1961, which says that it's all the forms of military cooperation between potential enemies in the interest of reducing the likelihood of war its scope and violence if it occurs, and the political and economic costs of being prepared for it. And the reason I like this definition is because it's so broad. I think we often have a perception, for those of us who are kind of in this community, that arms control means reducing the numbers of nuclear weapons that countries have, or limiting certain kinds of behaviors that countries practice. But in fact, it really means a whole multitude of things, and you can see that captured really clearly in this definition. So why are we talking about US and Russian arms control? Um, you know, that might seem obvious, but um, I think it's worth sort of focusing in on why we care about these two adversaries working together and why we're interested in finding ways to try to increase that cooperation in the interest of reducing global nuclear threats. And I like this chart because it shows very clearly why we're concerned about these two countries. Um, so this is a chart that, that shows um, sort of the latest data that we have on the numbers of nuclear weapons that the various nuclear weapon possessing countries have. And you can notice a couple of very clear things here. First, the United States and Russia have by far the largest numbers of nuclear weapons of any of these states. 
This is about 92% of the global arsenal that's in that US and Soviet stockpile. But the other thing that you can't see from looking at this chart that I also think is important is that this represents a very different landscape than what we would have seen if I were giving this talk in, say, 1984 or 1985. This is, in fact, a huge reduction in the number of nuclear weapons that both the United States and, at the time, the Soviet Union possessed. And so to me, that suggests that these approaches that fit under that definition of arms control that I showed a couple of slides ago are effective. They have moved the world towards closer towards a world free of nuclear weapons. We're obviously very far from it. But it suggests to me that there is great utility in trying to find these cooperative approaches. OK, and many cooperative approaches we have. So this slide shows a couple of the different kinds of modalities that we see between the United States and the Soviet Union or the United States and the Russian Federation in service of moving us towards this, this goal of a world free of nuclear weapons. And I'll just point out a couple of them because I think they demonstrate really clearly the breadth of that definition from Schelling and Halperin that I showed at the beginning of my presentation. So the first kind of you know, arms control agreement or the first modality of arms control agreement that probably seems the most familiar is that one in the middle. Quantitative arms limits, that's things like the New START Treaty, which says here are the numbers of nuclear weapons that the United States and Russia can possess. You have to stay below those numbers, and there are mechanisms for figuring out if you're cheating. But we also have limits on behaviors. So you see those kind of in that upper left-hand corner for you guys, limits on behaviors, things like preventing countries from conducting nuclear tests, preventing them from conducting nuclear tests in certain environments. Those also constitute arms control. They serve to prevent countries from developing new kinds of nuclear weapons that would require explosive testing. So I consider that to be part of this arms control landscape as well. And traditionally, Washington and Moscow have done a lot to cooperate in this space. Um, you also have um, what I would sort of describe as, as informal agreements. So we've been talking about things that are legally binding, agreements where there is an inspection regime to figure out whether countries are violating these treaties. But you also have informal agreements that lay out rules of the road. How should responsible nuclear weapon possessing countries behave? How should the United States and Russia behave? What do they regard as good behavior for countries that possess a lot of nuclear weapons to keep um, the risks of nuclear war low? And those include things like the 1973 Agreement on the Prevention of Nuclear War, which really describes what should happen if the United States and, at the time, the Soviet Union thought that they were edging closer to that brink. Um, so that I also consider to be part of the arms control landscape, and I think that's important to drive home because those are probably the kinds of agreements that we may be looking towards more in the future in a domestic political environment, particularly here, that's not very conducive to legitimating legally binding agreements in the ways that it might have been in the past. And then I'll say the last one here are transparency and confidence building measures. So sometimes you can't even get to the negotiating table because it's so challenging to figure out how to have a conversation with your interlocutor where you're able to exhibit the kinds of flexibility that are necessary to reach an agreement if your relationship is so bad that there isn't that fundamental basis of trust. And so another thing that I would include here in this arms control landscape are measures that are designed to build that kind of confidence. Um, maybe that includes, to use an historical example, visiting one another's nuclear test sites to better understand what their equipment looks like, to better understand how you would monitor to see if your adversary were conducting a nuclear test. That's not a legally binding agreement. It's not even really an informal agreement. It's a transparency and confidence building measure to let both sides feel pretty good about coming to the negotiating table and figuring out what's next. OK, so why would the United States and Russia do this? Um, why would it be in their interest to find these modalities to cooperate, whether they're legally binding, non-legally binding, informal, or more like transparency and confidence building measures? Well, that has been the topic of a great deal of my own research. And so I, you know, there are many reasons, many factors that drive countries to do this. But I'm going to highlight just a couple of them for you here that I think are particularly relevant to the present day. So what we see when we look at the historical record, which is a lot of what I end up doing in my own work, looking back at what was effective during the Soviet Union and trying to see if there are parallels for today, is that cooperation was often likely when US and Soviet or Russian leaders attached a high importance to arms control objectives and perceived convergent national interests that would be best served by collaborative action. So that seems pretty obvious, right? You both have to think that working together would probably serve your interests better than working apart. But that's not exactly a foregone conclusion, because there are a lot of issues on which adversaries decide I would be better off going at it alone. 
Another driver is the role of, of flexibility. So when the United States and the Soviet Union or the United States and Russia figured out that cooperation probably was in their best mutual interest, they were willing to show flexibility and compromise in order to advance those shared objectives. So as I'm sure you guys know, in any negotiation, when you come to the negotiating table, nobody gets exactly what, you, what they want. They have to be prepared to accept some limitations on their own abilities or their own capabilities. Um, you have to be willing to make trade-offs in the service of reaching a final agreement. And unless states are willing to do that, even if you perceive that something might be in your national interest to do together, you're probably not actually going to be able to make that happen. So that's a really key ingredient for adversaries, and in this case, the US and Russia, to work together on these sensitive issues. The third, I think, is a little bit less intuitive because it seems like diplomacy should be this sort of sterile environment where you're representing your country's national interests and your own personal feelings or relationships shouldn't really come into play, but that's not really true. We see from the historical record that personal relationships between Russian and American negotiators and policymakers really contributed in very significant ways to the processes of overcoming differences and reaching common positions on arms control issues. We have great examples of this in particular from the negotiation of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which might be familiar to some of you, the NPT. Um, there you had Russian and American or Soviet and American negotiators who were actually very good friends with one another. They would eat at each other's embassies. They would go hiking together in the mountains around Lake Geneva. And in fact, we have some great sort of records of conversations between two of these negotiators, George Bunn and Roland Timirbaev on the Russian side, where they were trying to figure out ways to work through some of the very challenging issues related to the safeguards regimen that accompanies the non-proliferation treaty. And it was on one of these hikes around Lac Le Mans in, in Geneva that they finally figured out a, a mechanism that would allow them to overcome some of the challenges that they had faced in agreeing upon some language for Article 3 of the NPT. But they had to use some fancy footwork to sell this back to their capitals. And so the story goes that um, both Bunn and Timurbayev, these American and Russian negotiators, decided that they would tell their bosses that the language that they had managed to agree on together was the language of the other side. And so when uh, Washington, or rather when the lead negotiator, Bill Foster, on the American side of the NPT negotiations cabled back to Washington to say, I think we found some language that's gonna work for Article 3, he said, but this is the language that's been proposed by the Soviet Union. I don't think we can make any changes to it. I think this is basically as far as they're willing to go. And on the Russian side, Roshan, who was the lead negotiator on, on the Soviet delegation, did exactly the same thing with exactly the same language. He cabled back to Moscow. He said, I don't know. This is the language that the Americans have proposed. I don't think they're going to be willing to make any changes. And so I think this is kind of a take it or leave it situation. And so you can see how kind of creativity, personal involvement, personal relationships really matter when it comes to getting an agreement kind of across the finish line in ways that I think are unexpected to those of us who are looking from the outside in where it seems like a negotiator is really just responsible for kind of advancing the positions of their government. That's true, but the individual matters. Okay, that's a long dalliance, but this leads me to my next point here, which is that cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union or the US and Russia on arms control issues was often fostered by the presence in both countries of strong institutional advocates. So those examples of those folks I was just talking about, George Bunn and Roland Timurbayev, they really believed very much in the importance of non-proliferation, the importance of arms control, and they used whatever sort of personal um, latitude they had to advance those objectives. And we see that all throughout the history of US and Soviet and US and Russian arms control negotiations. Things get done when you have people who care a lot about these issues and they do whatever they can in their individual capacities to advance that. And we'll come back to this theme as well because it's something that's important in the present day. Okay, we've been talking a lot about kind of internal factors, personal factors, individual factors, but what about exogenous factors, outside factors like nuclear crises? Might those also drive cooperation between adversaries like the United States and the Soviet Union or the US and Russia? on nuclear issues? Well, it's a great question, and it's one that I think we see a lot of thoughts about in the literature. So this is, um, this is a quotation from a, an article by a great analyst named Eugene Rumer, um, where he sort of lays out one view of the ways in which the relationships between crises and arms control play out. So he wrote, 
that while some attempts to manage, if not limit, the arms race were made in the 1950s between the US and the USSR, they produced very few meaningful results. The wake-up call for both Washington and Moscow was the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, which brought the two superpowers to the brink of annihilation. So the idea here is essentially that you know, the United States and the Soviet Union were trying to move arms control forward in a sort of middling fashion, but then once they came close to the brink of nuclear war at the hands of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, they became so scared that they felt they really had to get serious about their negotiations, and this helped to be a catalyst for moving those across the finish line. And you can see why people would think that this logic made quite a bit of sense. So this is a chart that does not, it's not exhaustive, so it doesn't show all of the arms control agreements between the United States and the Soviet Union and Russia, but it shows a lot of them. And these go from you know, 1963 to 2010. And what you see is that at the very beginning of this chart is indeed the Cuban Missile Crisis. So you can understand why it would make sense to think that because these two countries had been driven to the brink of nuclear war, suddenly this precipitated a very prodigious period in arms control between the United States and the Soviet Union and the US and Russia that then followed. So is that conventional wisdom correct? That's a question I've become very interested in in my own research, and I think there are lots of ways to look at that particular issue. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through some of my thoughts about, about this. But the bottom line up front is that I think the relationship is more complicated than the conventional wisdom reveals. So why do I say that? So first, we have some evidence that suggests things were not actually so great between the United States and Russia or the United States and the Soviet Union after the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred. So as you saw on the chart, you know, test ban treaty negotiations between the two sides had been ongoing since 1958, and they actually stopped for about eight months following the Cuban Missile Crisis. They became deadlocked over the issue of verification. So verification means making sure that the other side isn't cheating, and that's often a very important part of the arms control negotiation process where things can really become stymied because it requires you know, trusting the other side to essentially come on your territory and look at your sensitive stuff. And so during this eight-month period in which the test ban treaty negotiations were halted, the reason why they couldn't find a way to sort of move beyond those issues was that you know, Kennedy felt like he needed to have on-site inspections in order to sell an agreement to the Senate because he felt that Americans, particularly in the wake of the Cuban Missile Crisis, would feel that it was important to know if the USSR was upholding its obligations in this area. And on the Soviet side, Khrushchev felt like, if you're trying to come and look at my stuff on my territory, I think this is a pretext for spying, and so I don't want there to be any on-site inspections that are part of this negotiation. And so this became a really sticky issue that was kind of clarified and became more pronounced in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis in this environment of very, very deep mistrust and animosity. And these actually were not issues that ever were resolved. We ended up with a limited test ban treaty that does not have verification requirements in the form of on-site inspections, in part because the two sides were never able to work beyond this issue. They just agreed to disagree and to settle for something that did not require comprehensive um, on-site inspections. OK. The other piece of evidence, I think, that should complicate our understanding of the conventional wisdom is what followed the Cuban Missile Crisis in addition to that very prodigious period of arms control that I showed you on that chart, which was arms racing. So you not only have the United States and the Soviet Union beginning to negotiate some of the agreements that I showed you, you also have them building up their nuclear stockpiles. So five years out from the Cuban Missile Crisis, at the same time that you have all these arms control treaties being negotiated, you also have the US nuclear arsenal increasing by about 16% and the Soviet nuclear arsenal nearly tripling. That's pretty significant. Um, and so I think part of the reason for this and part of the reason that, that some scholars who were privy to, to these negotiations and to the discussions that were happening after the Cuban Missile Crisis suggest is that one of the big lessons learned for American policymakers and Soviet policymakers was, as it turns out, a strong deterrent is actually really useful. Um, and that was maybe a lesson that they learned from the Cuban Missile Crisis. It seemed for those in the United States who believed that Kennedy had looked Khrushchev in the eye and gotten him to back down by you know, sort of flexing the American nuclear muscle, that suggests it's a good idea to have some nuclear weapons in your arsenal that you can do that with. And on the Soviet side, where you had Khrushchev ostensibly you know, backing down, that can be an argument for 
building up your nuclear arsenal so that that doesn't have to happen again. And so I think a really important thing here is that we don't know what the lessons are that policymakers are going to derive from these crises. And sometimes they're not the lessons that you would expect if you think this is a scary event and what we should take away from this is that nuclear war is risky and we need to, to take steps towards mitigating those kinds of risks. Okay. So how did the two sides eventually get to the limited test ban treaty? Um, after all of this period of mistrust, this period of time in which negotiations were not actually happening, and during a period when you have this incredible buildup of the US and Soviet arsenals. Part of the reason comes back to a point I made earlier about the role of institutional advocates. So Kennedy was himself a very strong advocate for arms control. And if you read his early writing, even prior to when he entered office, he was what you know, the literature would call a nuclear pessimist. He was somebody who really did not feel like the world would get safer if more countries had nuclear weapons or if the countries that possessed nuclear weapons got more of them. So he was already a person who was fundamentally very interested in arms control. He had drank that Kool-Aid. He didn't need the Cuban Missile Crisis to show him that that was something that was important. Um, and what we see, we see evidence of this in, in a number of different policies that he put into place. So he actually debuted a very robust plan for nuclear disarmament at the United Nations in 1961 that had a whole bunch of measures that we then saw sort of get implemented even after his assassination under Johnson and subsequent US leaders. Um, and he also oversaw the negotiation from, you know, from Washington of a series of US and Soviet disarmament principles and sort of agreed measures that they were going to take to advance general and complete disarmament. This all happened prior to the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I really see this as evidence of the ways in which Kennedy himself was an institutional advocate for arms control. And we know that that is something that really matters in overcoming some of these difficult issues. And so the culmination of all of this happened in 1963 in June when President Kennedy delivered a speech at the commencement of American University, where he said, I am not going to be the first person to resume atmospheric nuclear testing. I'm not saying anything about what the Soviet Union needs to do. If they want to do that, that sounds great, but I am personally committing not to do this. And he also committed to reinvigorating the negotiations on the nuclear test ban treaty. And so by sort of taking that unilateral step, sure enough, very soon after that, Khrushchev came back and said publicly, I would also, I'm also not going to continue to conduct nuclear tests in the atmosphere. I would also like to re-engage on arms control agreements. And you, so you can kind of see how this one unilateral step that a strong institutional advocate for arms control like Kennedy took then precipitated the negotiations that followed. And indeed, in July of 1963, the two sides were able to arrive at an agreement. Okay, so let's take this historical case study and apply a little bit of these findings to the present. What impact could the war in Ukraine have on arms control? Um, I've just described this, what I see as a more complicated relationship than the conventional wisdom reveals about how crises can influence arms control. So let's see what that means for the present day. All right, so my colleague Heather Williams recently wrote an article where she described two potential pathways that arms control could take in the post war in Ukraine environment. And one she called an arms control renaissance. So that would be sort of the conventional wisdom that the war in Ukraine increases the salience of nuclear threats in such a way that leaders in the United States and the Russian Federation come back to the arms control negotiating table and start to try to reinvigorate that arms control architecture. But the other path that she foresees could be an arms control dark ages. So you, you, that might look more like what we saw in the Cuban Missile Crisis where you have leaders deriving lessons about the importance of a very strong deterrent or the need for instruments that can be used for you know, escalation management and things like that that then drive arms racing. So she sees these two different paths and kind of lays them out. And I think that the one that we end up taking, obviously not knowing how the war is going to end, depends on a couple of factors. So first, is these lessons learned. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis shows that the quote unquote lessons that law and policymakers learn from close calls and from nuclear crises really vary. If you read the documentary record, you can see that some people were genuinely very, very scared by the Cuban Missile Crisis. They felt like there was going to be a nuclear war. They felt like the world was gonna end. But for other people, they didn't feel like there was that incredible sense of risk and they felt like, no, we stood up, particularly on the US side, to Khrushchev. We managed to get him to stand down and this wasn't actually that close of a call. Um, and so that means that the lessons people take away from those events also vary quite a bit. 
Um, it is possible that if the sort of nuclear pessimist view uh, prevails, that I could imagine how the war in Ukraine could potentially revive interest in bilateral arms control. Um, maybe in the long run, that's not gonna happen immediately, but something that could happen in the long run. And I see that especially, the, the potential for that to happen, especially around nuclear risk reduction, so steps that would be taken to reduce the risk that nuclear weapons would actually be used. Um, those might be in some of the kind of non-legally binding areas that I was describing in an earlier slide. But I can also imagine how the war in Ukraine could lead domestic political constituents on both the US and Russian side to conclude that more nuclear weapons are needed for nuclear deterrence in that way that I was just describing to you in the way that we saw some people conclude in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if that happens, I think that's gonna make arms control a lot more difficult. It's gonna be hard for countries to see why they would wanna trade away capabilities that they think are important to their national security interests as exemplified by the lessons that they take from the current crisis. I also think another thing that is going to influence the path that we take with respect to arms control in the aftermath of the war in Ukraine has to do with atmospherics. So what is the atmosphere going to be in the relationship between the US and Russia? Um, I think here I'm quite pessimistic, you know, based on the past precedent and what we see from the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis in the public record, uh, it's very likely that this crisis is going to create an atmosphere of deep mistrust. So if you can even imagine the relationship between the United States and Russia getting worse, I actually foresee the potential for that to happen in the aftermath of the war in Ukraine, you know, irrespective of how it ends. Um, I think that's going to make policymakers less willing to compromise in the interest of reaching an agreement because as we know, you know, when it comes to negotiating with somebody, as we said before, you have to be able to exhibit this kind of flexibility in the interest of reaching an agreement that advances your shared interests. It's really hard to do that with somebody you don't trust. It's really hard to do that with somebody you're angry at. So again, this idea of, of emotions kind of influencing things that feel like they should be very sterile, um, high political negotiations, I think we will see that play out in a very significant and problematic way in the aftermath of the war in Ukraine. I also can see how this could make an interest in achieving so-called ironclad verification even more pressing for both American and Russian negotiators. And the irony here is that you know, there kind of is no ironclad verification. You can't ever be 100% sure that the other side isn't cheating. That's why George Shultz coined this phrase, or yeah, well, Ronald Reagan coined this phrase and then and George Shultz had an interesting article about it recently um, of trust but verify. This idea that you, you actually need to trust before you can verify um, because it's pretty hard to ever be absolutely certain that your adversary isn't cheating if you don't trust them in some manner. So I think this could drive an interest in trying to achieve this elusive goal of ironclad verification with arms control agreements in the post-crisis period that's going to actually make it really difficult to reach an agreement because no side is ever gonna to be totally satisfied with the kinds of verification protocols that they're able to achieve. So that I see as, as you know, an indication that we're probably headed down this arms control dark ages path. But, the caveat here is that we know from the historical record that political will and institutional and individual advocacy can go a long way towards overcoming a lot of these issues I've just described relating to you know, the atmospherics and the lack of trust. And so we know from, as I just described, Kennedy's 1963 American University Address that when leaders decide that it's time to move arms control forward, they can actually do a lot of stuff to really make that happen. Um, but the big unknown is whether there's going to be an appetite for that kind of high level institutional advocacy. And if so, when that's gonna happen? Would it be you know, eight months after the war in Ukraine ends? Would it be a year? Would it be 10 years? We really don't know. And the challenge of course is that there is only one remaining arms control agreement in place between the US and Russia and it's on a, on a timeline. It's going to expire in 2026. So we're kind of at a race for the finish line here to figure out what's gonna come first, the expiration of that or a moment when both sides feel that they have the latitude and the interest to kind of move these issues forward. Um, we don't have a lot of clues here. So this is a place where you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to even speculate what the timeline would look like. We've seen both the US and Russia indicate some interest in reviving this strategic stability dialogue that they had going in 2021. Um, but we haven't actually seen any action there yet. So I don't have good insights into what the timeline here might look like. A lot of that's gonna depend on the trajectory of the war itself. <laughs>
Okay, so a few additional thoughts before I take your questions because I really want to hear what you think about this. Um, these issues, arms control, non-proliferation, risk reduction, things like that, they might feel very ancillary to the war itself. And I, I remember when the war first broke out, I kind of couldn't wrap my mind around how we could be talking about these things at a time when there is a, an incredible humanitarian crisis and, and a shooting war happening on the ground. But my thinking is that nothing about this crisis is going to improve if there's also active arms racing happening at the same time, a further disintegration of the US and Russian arms control architecture, et cetera. So what I see my job is as a member of the academic community or the NGO community is to keep thinking about and suggesting potential ideas that can be taken up when the time is right. We don't know when that's gonna be, but we know that hopefully there will sometime be a moment where the clouds part and there is this opportunity to sort of put forward some creative proposals to move negotiations in a good direction. And it's our job to be thinking about what those kinds of things might look like so we can be ready to act. And in case you don't believe me or feel like you don't have anything to add to that conversation, I want to assure you that you do because um, as we actually know, the idea for Kennedy's moratorium that he announced in June of 1963 actually came from something that a cognitive psychologist proposed. So we need people who are you know, in all sectors to kind of be thinking about how to move this discussion forward. It's not just the political scientists and the IR folks, it's people from every, every discipline to be thinking creatively about how to do this. Okay, so that's it for me. I would love to take your questions and thank you so much for your attention. Okay, um, Sarah, thank you so much for those comments. Um, I'm Tom Hodge from the Russian department and my job is to help Sarah with the Q&A process. And so what we're gonna need to do because we're being filmed is if you have a question, please try to speak it into the microphone. Um, can I ask one of you to be the microphone yeah. minion? Yeah. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. Does anybody? I, okay, I'll go after you. Hi, thank you so much for um, a lovely talk. I was just wondering, um, so like, I think back in February, it seemed like, you know, I mean, at least from what I was reading, people thought the war was not going to go on as long as it has. And now it's almost, you know, it's mid-October and we're still here and it doesn't look like it's gonna let up anytime soon. So I don't wanna make any predictions about the length. Um, but in terms of the length, um, like how do you think that influences both present and future um, talks about nonproliferation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this, in fact, for exactly the reasons you just described. And you know, what comes to my mind is that even though the Cuban Missile Crisis lasted for much longer than those 13 days that we tend to talk about um, sort of in public discourse. It was a much shorter war than this. And so as we're trying to draw these parallels between past and present, that's something I've been really thinking about is how does that duration matter? Um, I've been thinking about this more in terms of kind of risk perception and what this means for risk taking behavior. I feel like the longer this conflict goes on, the more opportunities policymakers will have on both sides to recalibrate their perception of risk and sort of reset their framing for what constitutes risky and not risky behavior in this war. And Thomas Schelling, who I already quoted, actually talks about this concept of sort of moving down the slope towards nuclear war. And I think the longer a conflict goes on, the easier it is to start edging down that slope without necessarily recognizing that you're doing it. And so I think, you know, I could imagine if we go back to this paradigm of these two choices, you know, an arms control renaissance or an arms control dark ages, in some respects, the closer you get to something that feels like it could result in nuclear war, could drive interest in arms control in the aftermath. But on the other hand, if you fall down that slope, you know, that really changes the way that the landscape looks. And so it's hard to answer that question, but I think you're really, you know, hitting on something very important, which is that the length of the conflict matters, um, exhaustion matters, you know, people stop thinking about these issues in everyday ways, and that changes sort of the zeitgeist, I think, of the moment. Um, and so we'll have to see what that looks like and how that plays out, but it's a, it's a great way of thinking about this. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, very, very informative, very interesting.
Um, I, if I understand correctly, the scenarios you try to plan are happening when this war ends and what people do. But this war doesn't seem like it's going to end anytime soon, and we do not know how it's going to end. The big difference, I would say, with the 63 situation was that one of the nuclear superpowers at that time were not under threat. And at this time, one of the nuclear superpowers is under threat. So I can really see no scenario in which a superpower that has been cornered does not use nuclear weapons uh, in some capacity. And the big question is like, what does the other do? Mm -hmm. um, as we have seen in this war, you know, there were so many things we could not predict that would come that way. I think, I, I don't, I have not read anything that comes close to what uh, we have been living. So, um, if we continue in this path in which all the West uh, is arming Ukraine to be able to defend itself and uh, assault Russia, and Russia finds itself in a corner, then it uses nuclear weapons in some capacity, maybe strategic, uh, smaller. And then what? I mean, I, I think that's a question that we need to address before we're going into a question of how do we deal once we get on the table of negotiations for arms control. What do you think? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, I think I take a, perhaps a slightly more optimistic view of um, the potential for the use of nuclear weapons in this case. I think it's very, very hard for human beings to estimate in the abstract the probability of a, an incredibly rare event happening. And so, you know, I wouldn't purport to be able to tell you a percentage of likelihood that nuclear weapons will be used in, in Ukraine by Russia, but I, I, I can, it sounds like, unlike you, imagine a scenario where that doesn't happen. And so, um, you know, I think that would be one response that I'd have to, to your comments. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, each of us bringing what we can to this table, my focus as a person who works on US-Russia arms control issues really is on thinking about what happens when you get to the negotiating table. I'm, you know, thankfully not a nuclear strategist. I'm not responsible for making those decisions in, in the Pentagon or in Brussels. Um, so I don't have to think about, you know, what, what would a decision maker do if they were faced with that choice? And I feel fortunate that that's the case. Um, so for me, you know, I stick in my lane, which is thinking about what will happen when, when the clouds part and we're able to do this. But you're absolutely right that this is something that policymakers who are responsible for figuring out what various scenarios would look like and how to respond to them will have to do. And um, I think a big choice will be whether, you know, nuclear use of any type elicits a parallel response or whether a high precision conventional strike could equally well respond to, to that. And I think it would depend quite a bit on the scenario under which weapons were used. Was it a demonstration strike? Was it a tactical use of nuclear weapons? I, I don't think it would be a strategic you know, exchange initially. Um, but that's something that, that those folks are going to have to game out. And I'm sure they're doing that work right now. Hi there. Oh my gosh. OK. <laughs> I'm going to back it. OK. I think this is a good distance. Yeah. yeah. Well, hi, I'm good. Avalon. I'm also in your um, young woman in nuclear yes. non-cooperation, so it's oh great. Oh my gosh, it's so great to meet you in your yeah. life. Yeah. In person, yay. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I had a question, because um, currently, you know, there's a lot of um, just, reg I know you're, you, this talk was about arms control specifically, mm. um, but there is a lot of conflict going around the Zaporizhia mm -hmm. um, power plant. I, I, I hope I said that correctly, yep. but I was wondering if you think um, the Russian position in that conflict gives you any clues into um, their um, thoughts on arm control and other things of like nuclear risk in one context mm -hmm. versus another type of nuclear risk. But that's a great question. Um, well, I can think of one sort of very literal example that's not quite what you're asking about, but I think is adjacent. Um, so as you guys may know, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty just had its review conference, and um, I was able to go and watch some of those negotiations in, in New York. And one of the big issues, I could have seen a lot of issues that would have resulted from the war in Ukraine that would have interfered or made challenging the conclusion of a consensus final document in that setting, which is what those states parties are trying to do. 
But the one that seemed to me to be the most salient ended up being this very issue you raise about these attacks on a peaceful nuclear power plant in Ukraine in, in this region called Zaporizhia. And um, you know, the, the Russian delegation at these meetings was really not interested in having there be any specific language in a consensus final document that talked about specific attacks on that power plant, even if it wasn't necessarily attributing them to Russia. They really didn't want that level of specificity to be in there. They were okay, it seemed like, with language that would just say we shouldn't be attacking nuclear power plants generally, um, but they didn't want it to be specifically linked to that issue. So to me, that suggests a couple of things. I mean, I think you know that is something that I, I can imagine everybody would agree on, is that you know you shouldn't probably be conducting military operations around a peaceful nuclear power plant. Um, but it also suggests to me that it's going to be very difficult to negotiate these things that seem even like a foregone conclusion in the aftermath of the war in Ukraine, because that seems like it should be kind of a no-brainer for a non-proliferation treaty. And in fact, that was actually the issue that the conference fell apart over. They were not able to conclude a consensus final document. So um, all of that to say, I can't predict what will happen next, but I think you're hitting the nail on the head that that's an issue that's going to be challenging. I'm not sure it gives me that many clues into what I think a Russian position would be subsequently, but it suggests to me that we're in for a long road because these things that, that should be foregone conclusions and I think might have been in a previous time are now no longer kind of agreed principles. Yeah. Thanks. Um, one of the things that's become really vividly clear, I think, from your comments this afternoon is that um, we're dealing with, when we talk about the use of nuclear weapons, we're dealing with a, a vanishingly small historical record. They've only been used once in warfare by us, at, you know, to, to end the war in the Pacific. Um, proliferation problems, we've got lots of experience with that, as you've shown. Um, so, We've also once come, well, I don't know about once, but we've come very, very close to using them again in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so you, you've come back again and again and again to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so one of the things that's really clear to me is that the historical record, especially that crisis, is something we should all um, become very familiar with. You know, if we ignore it, we do so at our peril. And I was hoping that that would just, that I, that I could invite you to talk about the event that's gonna take place at Harvard University tomorrow um, on the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is one of the reasons you're out here in New England, um, because one of the great benefits is that they're gonna make it publicly accessible. So anybody sitting in this room can learn a huge amount about that crisis and its legacy and its possibility for illuminating a, a path that is going to be more peaceful for us. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tom. Thank you for um, that teeing me up for this plug. So um, it is true that I am here um, in the greater Boston area because tomorrow there is going to be this event at the Kennedy um, Belfer Center at Harvard um, that's going to focus on the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's going to go all day long, so it'll go from, I think, 8.30 until 5, and they are broadcasting it on Zoom, and anybody who wants to can register for that meeting and attend it. Um, and I can send... Uh, the link to some, to Katie maybe. Yes, I'll send Katie the link um, and, and you guys should feel free to sign up. But it, it's going to be very interesting. I mean, you can see the agenda online. It talks about a number of the things we've talked about here, sort of what are the lessons to be learned from the Cuban Missile Crisis? You know, what have we learned since that time as intelligence information has been declassified? What kind of new facts are there to be derived about this conflict? And then the panel that I'm going to be talking about at the end really deals with um, parallels between the Cuban Missile Crisis and the present day. And so, you know, to sort of preview what I'm going to talk about a little bit, I'm going to, you know, make the case that there are some dissimilarities, which have been already mentioned here, that should caution us in treating this as a literal antecedent to the present day. We need to be aware of those as we're drawing some of these lessons. But then there are these bigger parallels that I think foreshadow what might come at the negotiating table, you know, after the war in Ukraine ends or after policymakers deem it the appropriate time to start resuming these negotiations um, and what we can expect on that basis from that historical record. So I hope you'll join. I think it should be a really exciting event. Um, you know, it has some, some heavy hitters who are going to be participating and uh, I bet they'll have some interesting things to say. So please join. <laughs>
other questions, comments? Can I maybe follow up with just with just one more? Yes. Um, so, and and Takis's question um, sort of raised this issue: uh, tactical weapons versus strategic weapons. Mm. Okay, so tactical battlefield nuclear weapons on the one hand, strategic nuclear weapons like ICBMs and so on um, on the other hand. Now, as someone who lived through the you know the bulk of the Cold War and um, kind of experienced it growing up, it, it seemed like the discourse about nonproliferation was always focused on the, 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 wep the ICBMs, mm -hmm. the weapons that L Russia and the United States could launch at each other from hu great distances and destroy each other's countries completely, mutually assured destruction, all that stuff. We're now in a situation where, <laughs> where we're not thinking really about those kind of weapons at all. Instead, what we're thinking about are the tactical nuclear weapons. And, uh, you know, and you showed the bar chart, and I'm not sure, you know, that just said warheads. Right. And I, how are we defining a warhead? Does that mean a tactical nuke? Does that mean a strategic one? Have we sort of been ignoring, foolishly ignoring, the, the, the stockpiling of tactical nuclear weapons? Uh, or is it, you know, someone like Putin, if he does get backed into a corner, could use a tactical nuclear weapon, even if he only had 10 of them. So, mm -hmm. you know, trying to kind of prevent him from using them by keeping them, you know, keeping the stockpile small, maybe is sort of a fool's errand. I don't know. If you could just talk about the way tactical versus strategic kind of plays into this history that you've laid out for us and what might be happening in Ukraine, that'd be great. Yeah, sure, Tom. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, so um, you're absolutely right that traditionally U.S. and Russian arms control issues have focused on strategic weapons, these you know big weapons that can be launched from one another's countries at the other country. Um, but it's not for lack of trying to deal with the tactical nuclear weapons issue. So um, the United States has long been very interested in negotiating an agreement with Russia that would limit their tactical nuclear weapons. And we've never quite gotten there in part because, you know, uh, as we can see, you know, the weapons that a country has in its arsenal usually play some kind of strategic role. And you can see in the conflict in Ukraine, even though Putin has never explicitly said anything related to what kind of nuclear weapon he would use, um, that the threat of tactical nuclear weapons has been an effective deterrent in, in, in some ways. Um, and so you know, that influences a country's willingness to negotiate those kinds of capabilities away. Um, the closest we've ever gotten to anything that would look like a negotiation on tactical nuclear weapons was in fact not a negotiation at all. It was in the context of these presidential nuclear agreements that George H.W. Bush and first Gorbachev and then Yeltsin um, undertook in the early part of the 1990s. You had um, George H.W. Bush you know, bring back a lot of tactical nuclear weapons that the United States had forward deployed in Europe voluntarily you know, without any mechanism for verifying that that had happened. And then the Russian, the newly nascent Russian Federation was also willing to do that as well. And so that did go a long ways towards reducing the overall numbers of tactical nuclear weapons that both the US and, Russian ha and Russia had, but it wasn't done in a way that was part of a legally binding agreement or with any kind of verification mechanism. And so that remains for the US, the sort of holy grail is to have an arms control agreement with Russia that follows on New START, that would deal with both tactical and strategic weapons. And Russia is not interested in doing that. Um, and they've made, they have their own holy grail, which is a negotiation that would include um, ballistic missile defense. That's really an issue that they're very concerned about. And so I think as I'm thinking about what's gonna happen next and the atmosphere under which negotiations could proceed, you know, when you have an issue like that where even under better circumstances in the US and Russian relationship, it's been impossible to reach some kind of trade-off um, that strikes me as something that's going to be really, really difficult in this next phase, um, unless you know there's some sort of come to Jesus moment that that brings both sides to say we really need to deal with these issues because they're so dangerous. So, sounds like dark ages. It, indeed, yes. That's I'm sad to say. I think that's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as I know, when the Soviet Union broke up, Ukraine had its own. Um, nuclear arsenal, and it gave it up uh, in exchange for some guarantees from a bunch of countries that 
should something happen to Ukraine, those countries would come to its rescue. Um, now my question is in subjunctive mood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you think if Ukraine still had its nuclear arsenal, do you think this war would have been possible? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Allah. It's um, and it's one where you know people have very different opinions. So it's been interesting to hear what the kind of discourse is like among um, you know observers and scholars. I mean, in my personal view, and I should say too that there are people who are much more expert than I am about Ukraine's nuclear forbearance and the circumstances under which it was willing to allow those those weapons to be repatriated. But my understanding is that. Um, you know, it would have been very difficult for Ukraine at the time of its independence to maintain an arsenal like that. It requires, it's expensive, um, it requires a lot of infrastructure to keep those weapons safe and secure and in good working condition. And so what I've heard in my conversations with others is that that's almost a false counterfactual because there isn't any way that Ukraine could have sort of kept those weapons um, when the Soviet Union dissolved. Um, and so... But if we set that aside and just take the counterfactual in the way that you posed it, I mean, I don't, it's hard to answer. I don't think that that would necessarily have changed the calculus that much. I think, um, you know, Ukraine didn't really have control over those, those weapons. It couldn't use them. Um, those were Russian weapons that happened to be stationed on their territory. And so there would have been some real barriers to actually using them that I think would have undercut the credibility of that deterrent. Um, but it is a question that a lot of people raise, and the subsequent question that follows from that is, will this cause other countries that have said we're not going to get nuclear weapons to rethink that decision? Um, and so that's a big thing that the non-proliferation community is, is thinking about. I tend to believe that the reasons why countries pursue nuclear capabilities are much more diverse than just security concerns. I think it has to do with, you know, issues of prestige. It has to do with having the money and the know-how to, to do that. But it's still a question that a lot of people are asking right now. And it's one of those things that I think we're going to have to kind of wait and see um, how that looks. Yeah. I just had a question about what were you what you were saying about uh, arms control renaissance versus arms control dark age? I mean, do you first see the possibility at the in the aftermath of this conflict of something in between? I mean, certainly there's a lot of range contained in both of those eventualities. Um, but do you foresee the possibility of uh, arms control stalemate or arms control things stay how they are at the end of this conflict? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And I was actually thinking about that as I was looking at that slide. It's like, hmm, there is kind of a middle ground here. Um, and I, I, I think that's a realistic possibility to some extent because we did actually see that in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis. You had both this very prodigious period in arms control and you had this buildup of both the US and Soviet nuclear arsenals. And so to me, that does sound kind of like this middle of the road. You know, It means that the issues are gonna become more difficult later on. It doesn't necessarily mean that nuclear risks are being reduced because there's a vertical proliferation of weapons. But on the other hand, you have a more robust arms control architecture. You have you know, the United States and the Soviet Union at the time developing better mechanisms for working with each other and a better kind of sensibility for how that works in the nuclear space. And so to me, that does sound very much like a, I don't even know what we would call this between a renaissance and a, and a dark age, I don't know, kind of a um, gloomy day. Like, I don't know what really that would be. But in any case, I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head that we could see something that's in between the two. And um, it'll be interesting to see how the international community deals with that, because those are two paradoxical developments. Yeah, great question. Okay, we should probably um, wrap things up. Um, so please um, remember that Sarah is one of you and she is eminently contactable um, mm -hmm. and you can easily find her um, online. I also urge you to take part cyberspatially, remotely in the Cuban Missile Crisis event that's taking place all day tomorrow, um, and especially tune in for Sarah's part. <laughs> I mean, um, but 
anyway, having said all that, please, I ask you to join me in thanking her for this beautiful presentation. Sarah, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all so much.